I hope you will agree it was not just a privilege to listen to Singapore's man for all seasons, true hero, but it was a very touching, warm tribute to Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. He cited two central or cardinal contributions that Mr. Lee made, which was to establish Singapore in the world of, uh, in the international community, even while it was a colonial state, and uh, the ethic of multiracialism. And his very special nuggets about Mr. Lee's encounter with Mr. Hua Kofeng, and his personal warm nuggets about how Mr. Lee was a caring leader. Please join me in giving Mr. S.R. Nathan, again, our former president, a very big round of applause. Thank you, Mr. Nathan. Now for our next stop, Mr. Lee, on Mr. Lee Kuan Yew's ideas on the role of the state, and this session will be moderated by Professor Tommy Koh, who is a member of the Lee Kuan Yew School's governing board. He will introduce the speakers and the subject of discussion. Please join me in inviting Professor Koh, Mr. Janadas Devon, Director of the Institute of Policy Studies, and Mr. Singh Han Tong, the Honourable Member of Parliament for Ang Mo Kyo GRC. Please. Thank you, Jillian. Uh, I must confess to Kishore that I have a problem. We are beginning about 15 minutes later than schedule. So with your permission, may I end the session and 10 minutes later than schedule and eat into the tea break. Thank you. Um, I would also like to join Jillian in thanking our good friend, Mr. S.R. Nathan, for his um, very intimate and thoughtful reflections on Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. I want to say that um, Mr. Nathan is 89 years old, and next year we will have the pleasure of celebrating your 90th birthday. <laughs> um, we are gathered here today to celebrate Mr. Lee Kuan Yew's 90th birthday, to take stock of his legacy for Singapore, and also to see how we can improve on that legacy. And we will begin this morning with a panel on the role of the state. We have two very distinguished speakers. Their biographies are in the booklet, so I will not introduce, I will not repeat what's in the booklet. I will simply remind them that each of them has 15 minutes for their opening statement. Mr. Janada Devon, please. Thank you, Professor Ko. President Nathan, Chief Justices, ladies and gentlemen. Today is not only Mr. Lee Kuan Yew's 90th birthday. Today marks also the 50th anniversary of the formation of Malaysia on September 16, 1963. On that day, Sabah, Sarawak, and Singapore merged with Malaya to form the Federation of Malaysia. M.M. turned 40 that day as he proclaimed on the steps of the City Hall that Singapore shall be forever a part of the sovereign, democratic and independent state of Malaysia. It is very difficult to see this straight, but what this means is that today marks also the 50th anniversary of Singapore's independence from British colonial rule. August 9, 2015 will mark the 50th anniversary of Singapore's independence from Malaysia. We celebrated September 16th as our national day on only two occasions, in 1963 when Malaysia was formed and in 1964. By 1965, this Independence Day was superseded by another, August 9th, which of course comes before September 16th and always has. In 
it is within this fortuitous triangle formed by Mr. Lee's birthday, the 50th anniversary of Malaysia's founding, and August 9, that I will try to locate what I think is the singular quality of Mr. Lee and his generation of leaders. I won't talk about MM's big ideas as such, as the title of this conference rather potentously puts it, but of a big idea behind the big ideas, or more accurately, the big sentiment, spirit, emotion, passion that runs through, like a baseline, Mr. Lee's public life, and in the absence of which, those big ideas would have accounted for nothing. Those ideas were important, of course. Singapore did undoubtedly essay a number of unique ideas in development. From the early decision to welcome MNCs while the rest of the developing world kept them at arm's length, to establishing a unique system of tripartism that built on the German and Japanese models, from CPF to HDB, from GIC to NPARCs, from the Presidential Council of Minority Rights, to the system of group representation constituencies or GRCs, the list is very long. The image, the image that occurs to one as we recall what went into creating this country is not that of the nanny or the housekeeper, let alone the East Asian autocrat of caricature. A more apt image might be that of the constant gardener whose careful husbandry of resources, talent, and values was devoted persistently to fitting everything to a whole. And the statecraft involved here was more than a question of technique. Nation building is quite different from assembling a Meccano set. The gardener cannot be distinguished from the garden. Statecraft, especially at the founding of nations, is indistinguishable from soulcraft. One can theoretically produce a compendious Bible on development based on Singapore's experience. How to plan industrial parks, how to house 80% of your population in public housing, how to have people save for their own retirement, how to organize a formidable military force, how to plan a city and make it livable and green, how to combat corruption, maintain law and order, enforce the sanctity of contracts, and so on and so forth. But would it be possible to build another Singapore elsewhere simply by applying all the ideas, big and small, that might be contained in such a book? Would Singapore itself have become Singapore of today if, say, the civil service of that time had possessed this book in 1965 but without the gardener. What was special about these gardeners? Well, there was more than one of them, and Mr. Lee was the remarkable leader of an extraordinary team. What defines the soul that fashioned this unique state? I think the answer can be found in the fortuitous triangle I mentioned earlier, formed by Mr. Lee, September 16th and August 9th. History, writes Churchill somewhere, with his flickering lamb, stumbles along the trail of the past, trying to reconstruct its scenes, to revive its echoes and kindle with pale gleams the passion of former days. It is very difficult to do this, but we owe it, on this occasion at least, to try. Most of us here have grown up with the same government almost all our lives. We might be excused if we thought the PAP was always dominant that Mr. Lee was born fully formed and armed, as Athena was from the head of Zeus. But that is not how it happened. It took years for the PAP to establish its dominance, for the legitimacy of the state to be confirmed as more than a legal entity. In 1959, the PAP won the elections and formed the government of self-governing Singapore with the support of the Communist Party of Malaya. There is no doubt whatsoever that the mass base then was with the detainees led by Lim Chin Siong. When the inevitable split came, the inevitable split between the pro-communist and the non-communist left came in 1961, the PAP was left with almost nothing. The party lost almost all its branches and all but a rump of the unions went over to the other side. It almost lost power altogether and hung on to it by just one seat in Parliament, or the Legislative Assembly, as it was called then. The turn really came in 1965. July 10, 
1965 to be precise. That was the day when the moral political legitimacy of the nascent state was established. That was the day when the result of a by-election in Hong Kong, in Hong Lim, sorry, right at the center of Chinatown, became known. The PAP had lost the constituency twice in a row before. First, in a 1961 by-election, which Mr. Ong Eng Guan, the former mayor and minister of national development, had forced. Ong received 7,747 votes to the PAP's Jack Yun Tong's 2,820. Second was in the 1963 general election when Ong received about 5,000 votes and the Barisan Socialist candidate about 2,300. And together they got about 64% of the votes. The PAP candidate, Siam Wee Kok, a trade unionist, received a miserable 33% of the votes. And barely two years later, in July 1965, just a little less than a month before separation, in a straight fight between the PAP's KC Lee, who is present in the audience today, I think, and the Barisan's Ong Chang Sam, the PAP won with 60% of the votes. How come? Because the people understood what was at stake. Relations between Singapore's leadership and the federal government in Kuala Lumpur had broken down. There had been racial riots in Singapore in 1964. And Singapore's leaders, in particular Mr. S. Rajaratnam and Dr. Toh Chin Chai, had organized a Malaysian Solidarity Convention and had embarked on a campaign for a Malaysian Malaysia throughout the Federation. The PAP had lost badly in the 1964 Malaysian GE winning only one of the 13 seats it contested in Peninsula Malaysia. But it seemed on the way to establishing itself as a power beyond Singapore. Ong Eng Guan's sudden resignation from the Legislative Assembly in June 1965, Singapore's leaders at that time believed, had probably been engineered by Kuala Lumpur to test the PAP's strength. It had lost twice before in the same constituency. If it lost again, its hold on Singapore would have been doubted and the legitimacy of, the, of its Malaysian Malaysia campaign severely damaged. If the PAP had lost in Hong Lim again, that would have been used as a pretext to crush the party and forcibly change the leadership in Singapore. Various UMNO leaders had already openly called for Mr. Lee's arrest. Even the Chinese Comprados um, uh, in the Chinese in the in the in the Malayan Chinese Association in Malaysia had called for his arrest. With one of them urging the Tunku to put Li Kuan Yew away to sober him up. Word of all this reached British Prime Minister Harold Wilson, who records in his memoirs that he told the Tunku that if his government ordered the arrest and detention of Li. He, the Tunku, need not attend the next Commonwealth Prime Minister's conference. Wilson writes in his memoirs, If Lee were imprisoned, there would be an accident one morning and it would be written off as suicide. Easiest thing in the world to organize. Singapore's leaders made contingency plans. Lee himself would accept arrest. As the leader of the movement, he had little choice. But others in the leadership would escape elsewhere, to Cambodia, where a Singapore government in exile would be established, and to London and elsewhere in the world from where they would continue the fight. John Drysdale reports in his book, Singapore, Struggle for Success, that Dr. Toh had found a jungle green uniform and was preparing for the day when, rather than be arrested, he would take to the jungle as a guerrilla fighter. Thankfully, Dr. Kuto was saved from this fate by the PAP's victory in Hong Lim on July 10th. People at the heart of Chinatown had seen Singapore's leaders, in particular Mr. Lee, fight back ferociously, refusing to be cowed. Their decision to stand by Mr. Lee's leadership sealed our fate. The Tunku and his senior ministers decided 10 days later that Singapore had to go. Thus, we got August 9th. 
Ultimately, people follow leaders with fire in their bellies, to use a very old-fashioned expression. It wasn't ideas, big or small, that established the legitimacy of the state in the crucible of its founding. What established that legitimacy in the eyes of the people was the conviction that government was on their side. On May 27, 1965, Mr. Lee addressed the Malaysian parliament for the last time when he moved an amendment to the motion to thank the king for his opening address. Everyone from Singapore who was present at the chamber that day describes the event in almost identical words. You could hear a pin drop when Mr. Lee switched to Malay. You could see Amno Bank batches sit up and listen as the front bench sank ever deeper into their seats. A colleague of mine at BMO's comms group chanced upon a recording of an excerpt of the speech in our national archives. I shall now play a brief clip of it. An unstable and an unsafe situation. And I would like to remind members of the government that they will find in the PAP and I hope in the members of the Convention, Malaysian Solidarity Convention, a loyal, constructive opposition, an opposition in accordance with this Constitution. There's no use threatening us, you know, that you're going to take away our local autonomy in Singapore and so on. It cannot be done unless you're going to use the guns. And as I've said, you haven't got enough guns. And we are not going to allow them to get rid of the member for Sarawak affairs and member for Sabah affairs. I think they are valuable parts of Malaysia. Because you could put 100,000 troops in Sabah and Sarawak and they may never be seen or heard of again if the Ibans don't like you. <laughs> I mean, let's be frank, we did this calculation carefully and methodically. There is no other way. It is not credible. You want to hold little Malaya? Maybe. Hold Malaysia on that basis? The threat is not credible. Minister for Sarawak Affairs has got a knowing smile. Like <laughs> he knows. I mean, they are a, a head-hunting people, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> head-hunting people. <laughs> Let me inform all these members, I ah, will change this, we'll change that. This solemn document says 161H, you will change nothing of the sort without the consent of the state government. And first you've got to win a democratic election in Singapore. And we hold it quite democratically, you know. They say nine days, all right, I promise them next time. A full, real long spell. On radio, on television. The whole works. We run, never run away from the open confrontation. As our friends from Barisan Socialists can testify, we love it. We relish the prospect of a meeting of minds, a conflict of ideas, not of force. There you have it, Mr. Lee and his generation's finest hour. What is the singular big idea, the big passion, emotion behind the big ideas? Simply put, guts, courage. Before you can have a state, you, before you can have ideas for a state, there must be a prior set of decisions. This is who we are. This is what we believe. Here is where we will make a stand. Thank you. Um, Janadas Devan is always brilliant, but he um, didn't really address the topic of the panel, the role of the state. What he gave us was, in his own unique way, a short history of the PAP, how it achieved the dominance it has enjoyed in recent decades, and how independent Singapore came to be. Um, 
The second speaker is a good friend, Mr. Singh Han Tong. I hope you will address the topic of the panel. <laughs> Mr. Saranen, uh, former president, Professor Jaguma, uh, Professor Kiso, dean of the school, my parliamentary colleagues, friends. In my view, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew has been asking himself over the last 50 years three big questions on language and on bilingualism. Can I have the first slide? Question number one. Next slide, please. Should a multiracial and multilingual society like Singapore be bilingual or monolingual? Question two. Can a person master two languages equally well? Question three. How did he fare in trying to translate his ideas on bilingualism into reality? In fact, the key question in the minds of many is what made Mr. Lee a strong believer that Singaporeans must master English and know their mother tongue? I will argue that thoughts were already forming in Mr. Lee's mind from a very early stage. Let me bring you back to 1947 when Mr. Lee studied in Cambridge. He would constantly or occasionally uh, visit the China Institute in London, a gathering place for all students of Chinese ethnicity. I should quote him from his book, My Lifelong Challenge, Singapore's Bilingual Journey. Next slide, please. This is a book I quoted. I often went there and would see Chinese students from all corners of the world. From that essence, you could tell where they were from, China, Hong Kong, Malaysia. For example, the most pitiful were those from the West Indies. They spoke in Sing Song West, they spoke in Sing Song West Indian English, and absolutely no Chinese. I felt very sad of them. I vowed that I would not be like that. That was when I began to feel a sense of loss about not knowing Chinese, and decided not to repeat this state of affairs with my own children. And as you know, and as you know Mr. Lee sent his three children to a Chinese school. What I saw there stayed with me for the rest of my life and fueled my determination to learn Chinese and push bilingual education in Singapore." Unquote. This was not simply about language. It was also part of Mr. Lee's political awakening. Mr. Lee began to realize why studying in England that he was not one of them, even though he spoke their language. Culturally, he was different. I would argue that it was at this point that he began his search for values. Later, Mr. Lee said that following my experiences as a student in London and Cambridge, I believe firmly that knowing one's mother tongue was a must. It gives one the sense of belonging to a culture and increases self-confidence, self-confidence and self-respect. Hence, we decided that we must teach each student two languages, English and mother tongue. Indeed, through the decades, Mr. Lee has been consistent in his argument that mother tongue provides the foundation of a value system for our children, especially in a multilingual society like Singapore. In 1966, at the opening of the seminar on education and nation building, he talked about language problems in schools. I quote, there's the necessity for preserving for each child that cultural balance and appreciation of his origin and his background in order to give him that confidence 
to face the problems of his society. He must know from whence he came and how it is that he swear he is before. He is able to make the problems and make the decisions which he must make to adjust himself and his family in the society in which he has decided to make a home. Speaking elsewhere of this value, Mr. Lee has also observed that the mother tongue gives one the value. So, what was the background to language education in Singapore when Mr. Lee returned from his studies? In 1952, the study of uh, molecular languages was introduced in government primary schools but was only made compulsory from 1955. Then came the all-party report in 1956 which laid the seeds of bilingual education in Singapore. The all-party report recommended that the future education system in Singapore should produce students equally conversant in two or even three of the main languages. The committee was chaired by the then Minister for Education, Hugh uh, Sui Ki, and included assemblymen like Mr. Lim Bing and Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. So even from an early stage, Mr. Lee was involved in these debates. And I know in passing that that language issue were on the PAP agenda from day one. The PAP founding manifesto in 1954 emphasized the importance of all four languages, English, Malay, Chinese, and Tamil. And you know that uh, in '54, of course, the PP was still in opposition. Now let's move to the key question. That is, how did he fare in trying to translate his ideas on bilingualism into reality? While in opposition, Mr. Lee would have seen the practical difficulties, sensitivities in language, and ethnicity could literally start a riot. Mr. Lee would have seen, for example, the difficulties in implementing the all-party report in 1950s. And he was to say later, and I quote, the outbreak of violence among Chinese medium school students in the 50s was a constant reminder of what chaos and disruption the students led by lefties could mount when they interpreted the bilingual policy as reducing the primary role of Chinese. We could not make English the first language in our schools at that time. It would have caused a riot. We moved carefully, step by step, to enable parents to realize how English would leave their children's future prospects. Enlightened self-interest will get people to accept our bilingual policy. Uh, this is an important point. Chinese schools taught their curriculum mainly in the Chinese language. Asking the Chinese schools and Chinese educationists to give up Chinese as a teaching medium was a very emotive one and politically risky. So how did he achieve this? The answer is slowly and carefully. The first step, of course, was the emphasis on English. Mr. Lee, from an early stage, was determined that part of the issues was that Singapore's ethnic groups had to have the platform to communicate with each other. This is what he had to say on the subject in 1966 when speaking about the various ethnic groups in Singapore. He said, I quote, We must try to give them common denominators or you will have a situation in which there will be no communication between sectors of your own society. And one decision we made, again, I believe rightly, is that in this situation, a person who is monolinguist, competed only in one language, is a problem to himself and to his society. If you know only one language, wherever it may be, Chinese, Malay, Tamil, or English, and no other language, then in this society, you will find yourself a problem for yourself and for your society. And invariably, you will find that with a knowledge of another language, which means an understanding of a different culture, a different civilization, and more windows in the mind comes inevitably tolerance and understanding. Unquote. 
Now, not many people uh, know that Mr. Lee was our Minister for Education for four months in 1975. And it was during those four months when Mr. Lee was our sixth uh, Education Minister that he was able to closely scrutinize the education system and he realized that years of promoting bilingualism in schools were not having the desired effect. The majority of students were failing in their language. Only 19, one night, 19 percent of primary one students make it through secondary four with pass in both first and second language. I believe that Mr. Lee's experience as a Minister of Education left an impression on him. A lot of Mr. Lee's beliefs were gained or reinforced during this period. And by the mid of late 70s, Mr. Lee had become clear that one-size-fits-all approach did not work. People have different abilities and different home environments. For example, a large part of the 75% Chinese, Chinese population had to grapple with three languages, dialect at home, Mandarin and English in school. And to solve the problem, the Prime Minister proposed that Mandarin replace the other Chinese dialects, whether it's Hokkien, Teochew, Cantonese, as a language spoken in the homes. This also facilitate the learning in, of Mandarin in schools. So the 1979 Go King Sui uh, report on education addressed this issue head on. It stated that the basic objective of our education system should be to produce school leavers who are literate in at least one language. And to address this problem and the high rate of attrition, streaming, you know the streaming, was introduced in primary three onward and also secondary schools. Now, this links back to one of the questions I posed earlier. Can a person master two languages equally well? This is a sensitive and sometimes even an emotional one. But let me deal with Mr. Lee's thoughts on the subject. He eventually came to the conclusion that a person may be bilingual or even trilingual, but one language will be, on, will be the nominal language. This is what you say in 2009. At first, I thought you can master two languages, maybe different intelligence. You master at a lower level. I give you my conclusion now, which nobody in the education department, no expert knows. Nobody can master two languages at the same level. If you think you can, you are deceiving yourself. The brain is not structured to have the language capability. That's the first thing I learned, unquote. Now, many uh, of you here must have attended the National Rally uh, when Mr. Lee was the Prime Minister uh, since, uh, from 1966 to 1990. Now, he had been delivering his National Rally speech also in Hokkien, on top of Mandarin, English and Malay. Then came a point when the Education Ministry pointed out to him that he was not setting a good example by talking Hokkien when school was trying to teach Mandarin. So his last speech in Hokkien was in 1979. And in the same year, on 17 September 79, in fact, three weeks after his last Hokkien rally speech, he launched a Speak Mandarin campaign. And at the launch, Mr. Lee urged all the young people, students and graduates, to give up dialects in five years and to have Mandarin, English and Malay become the language of the coffee shops, hawker centers, shops, cinemas and other private places. So years later, in, 19, in 2005, when asked if he worried about the political cause of giving up Hokkien, as many people were then still speaking dialects, Mr. Lee said, next. Uh, next slide, please. I had, uh, I quote him from this book, uh, the previous slide, please. Now, I quote him from uh, his book. The next slide, please. 
Okay, go on. Uh, I had a responsibility not to mislead the young. As long as I was still speaking Hokkien at the National Rally, I was in fact saying it's okay to do so. If so, people would never give up Hokkien. They would never move to Mandarin. So the Speak Mandarin campaign would fail. And the learning of Mandarin in school would never be successful. So then of my surprise, setting a good example, it had to be done. Everyone has a limit. You have to decide what do you want to do within your limited cap capacity and how do you maximize for your life, unquote. Mr. Lee, in fact, was a very tactful persuader. This had been turned English into our main medium of uh, education by 80s. However, he was very direct and forthright with the elimination of um, Hokkien, even at the risk of offending people. Ministers like uh, Lin Kim San, To Ching Chai, who were comfortable in dialect, understood the intellectual argument that people had a finite ability to absorb language, but emotionally, they were not convinced. Mr. Lee was aware of the sensitivity. In 1978, when the bilingual policy was introduced, he was aware, he was aware that minority race might think that this was a ploy to force Mandarin on them. He sought to calm this sensitivity. So addressing this point in 1979, he acknowledged that the initial fears will be unavoidable. He said, and I quote, the Malay or the Indian or the Malaysian will say, look, what are we doing? We say we are bilingual, but does bilingualism mean English Mandarin and not English Malay or English Tamil? But if, in fact, it's not then, it's only a matter of time, whether it will be three months, six months, one year, before the truth dawns on everybody that no, no non-Chinese need have to learn Mandarin or need to be at a disadvantage. Unquote. So understand, understanding this uh, sensitivity and being bilingual is also good politics. Part of PAP's dominance can be attributed to the fact that it has always been a party for all races and all the official languages. Now, Mr. Lee was uh, in promoting Mandarin. Mr. Lee was serious in promoting Mandarin, even among the ministers were Chinese. This comes from my personal experience, witnessing the ministers practicing Mandarin during lunchtime. In March 1992, Mr. Lee, then senior minister, launched the Speak Mandarin luncheon for ministers at Istana. Senior journalists from Chinese press were invited to join the lunch, and I was one of them. I recall that a week before the launch, Mr. Go Chok Tong, then Prime Minister, shared with us at the lunch that the conversation during these lunch meetings would be entirely in Mandarin. The idea was to force them and other ministers to discuss current affairs in Mandarin with people from Chinese-speaking background. This would help him overcome the psychological barrier, pick up more Chinese vocabulary, especially on politics and economics, and form a habit of speaking Mandarin more naturally, without inhibitions. Mr. Goh said that once they gain enough confidence, they will start doing so in public. Of course, all this will be done without causing uneasiness among the minorities. And at the launch of the uh, Minister's Mandarin Luncheon, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew hoped that ministers, ministers would cultivate the habit of speaking Mandarin to the Chinese ground once they got used to the terms used in politics and policies. Present at the inauguration lunch uh, were PM Go Chok Tong, Minister for Education, Lee Yok Suan Den, Mika Minister, Jok Shio, Minister for Labour, Dr. Lee Bunyang, I saw he was here, and Minister for Communications, Mr. Ma Bao Dan. And you may ask, did their Mandarin improve? I would say for Mr. Go, Mr. Go really uh, put in an effort to learn Mandarin. And since then, his Mandarin has improved over the years, as can be seen from this yearly National Day Rally uh, Mandarin speech. You may also ask, are all ministers effectively bilingual? 
The answer is no. This solves the difficulties of language learning. But the fact is that they persisted and it was important that they could communicate with the ground in the mother tongue. In conclusion, after half a century of try and error with our bilingual policy, let me uh, attempt to summarize some core principles that got Mr. Lee's thinking on bilingualism. In fact, he listed out eight principles. I just got the three principles. Principle number one, language policy can make, a, make or break a nation. By choosing English as our language of administration, we managed to avoid the political fallout that would have come had we chosen either Malay over Chinese or Chinese over Malay. Principle, sorry, principle number one, language policy is a vital instrument for achieving national interest objective and meeting the needs of governors. And that was our principle number two. And then come to principle number three. Language transmits values. Language is more than a tool of communication. It transmits values too. That is why we have insisted that all schools going children learn their mother tongue, whether Chinese, Malay, or Tamil, as their second language. Language is the core of how Mr. Lee Kuan Yew defines the Singapore nation building project. English is the language of the workplace or administration. But our mother tongue helps us retain our core cultural values as Chinese, Malay, or Indians. And finally, it's a never ending journey. You and I, among many Singaporeans who have gone through this journey at different points of time. And we know that in the process, we have built up the largest and most complex language laboratory in the world, providing various borders and examples for other multilingual countries' reference and for the sociologists and language planning studies. And after 50 years in politics of observing the world by striving to build Singapore into a first world nation, Ms. Lee has come to the conclusion that our decision to have a bilingual education system was the right one, the right one. He noted that we did not get it right from the start. We went through many years of trial and error and learned hard lessons along the way. But this did not mean our work was done. Educational policy, education policy, especially pertaining to, pertaining to language, will always be work in progress. And Mr. Lee put it, no policy in Singapore has undergone so many adjustments and reviews as a policy on the teaching of mother tongue language, and in particular, the Chinese language. These have been necessary to maintain that dynamic balance between the needs of the country and the concerns and preference of individuals and communities. Looking, the, looking uh, back, the bilingual journey has been a bumpy a bumpy and never anyone. And indeed, after spending his entire political career trying to make bilingual, bilingualism work in Singapore, Mr. Lee is still trying, even now. And Mr. Lee is truly the chief architect of Singapore's bilingual policy. Thank you. Mr. Singh has also not addressed <laughs> the, the topic of my panel. Um, he's given us a very valuable speech about uh, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew's language policy. And Mr. Lee Kuan Yew's language policy has, I think, three prongs. First, the promotion of English as a language of administration and the lingua franca of Singapore. Second, the requirement that every child in our schools be required to learn the mother tongue of his father, not his mother. The Ministry of Education should stop using the phrase mother tongue because it's a father's tongue. <laughs> if, if, a, if, a Chinese, if a Chinese man marries a Malay wife, the child is required to learn Chinese and has no discretion to study Malay. And the third prong of Mr. Lee's language policy is the suppression of dialect, which is still controversial among many of, of the Chinese-speaking uh, community. So that's Mr. Singh's uh, contribution. Um, 
Jilin, is it possible for you to give another microphone to Mr. Singh? Because there's only one microphone here, which I've given to Janadas. Given the shortage of time, I suggest we take um, three, three brilliant questions from you. And I will ask Kishore to ask the first brilliant question. And please, ask a question on the role of the state. <laughs> a microphone for Kishore, please. Where are the microphones? <laughs> lakas, lakas. Uh, Tommy, caught me, Tommy caught me sleeping on the job. <laughs> you know, I, I agree with you, Tommy, that we did not specifically address the question of the panel. But nonetheless, I think we got at least two profound insights. One is what a close shape Singapore had in not becoming a state. I think very few people are aware of that, and that came through very clearly in Janadas' presentation. And secondly, the choice of language is absolutely critical because if, you, know, you look at Timor Leste and why that nation which became independent, almost became a failed state, was because it chose the wrong language. So even though we may not have addressed the question of the panel, we did actually touch upon two critical choices that shaped Singapore's I, I evolution. I would object to your remarks about Timor-Leste. Uh, well, I, is, I, I, is, I've, I've said this not, it, it is not a failed state. And it, once, almost, it almost became uh, a failed state, and it, there were, the government was almost overthrown. I was president of the Security Council on the day when Timor-Leste became independent, and I told the Prime Minister, Mari al Khatari in the office of the Presidency Security Council, be careful. The, if you do make the wrong decisions, you will suffer. So the, the, the thing I'm emphasizing here is that we take Singapore's success for granted. I think that's a mistake. We've been extraordinarily lucky in some ways. So my question to the two panelists is, if you look ahead for the future, what critical decisions does Singapore need to make now to ensure we keep up the success? Thank you. Um, could we have a question from this side of the hall, please? Anyone here? Um, brilliant question. No. Um, Victor, you want to ask a question? No. Um, someone from here? Yes, please. Asad Latif. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, actually, this is not a follow-up question to Professor Mabubani's, but I don't know what comes. Uh, what's the term for something that should have come before that question? Can you speak louder? Sorry, um, this is not a follow-up question, but a kind of uh, question that leads to his question. I'd like to ask both panelists, um, although you have rightly spoken about policies, what is that critical philosophy in the making of Singapore which we can hold on to whoever is the Prime Minister, whichever political party 50 years down the road might be an authority. What is that one single thing that Singapore cannot do without? Okay, thank you. Thank you. One more question. Yes, please. Microphone, please. Uh, tell me. Microphones are I have a question line. here. You missed the center stage. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, Dr. Kamin. May I? Thank you. This is not a brilliant question, but I think, you know, we can overdo that concept of meritocracy. People who don't have a brilliant question should be able to ask questions. <laughs> Uh, my question is this, and I'll try to stick to what you said about the role of the state. Um, Mr. Janus Devon has very uh, movingly demonstrated that the success of Singapore isn't just based on the vision and ideas of our leadership, but the personality of Mr. Lee himself, his tenacity, 
his determination, the fire in his belly. So my question to the panelists is this. How do we see the future of Singapore um, that is going to be propelled to a large extent by the, the ideas of our founding fathers? But I, as I think we all recognize, uh, Mr. Lee's personality is unique. Uh, so how do we do it with his ideas, but not without his personality? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, one, one more question, please. Uh, uh, Professor Chua Beng, what is it? Couldn't quite see. Hi. Uh, yes, I think, like the chairman, I'm a little bit disappointed for no discussion of the state in the two speeches. Um, I think that in the case of Janadas being a good friend, I think he intentionally avoided the question. <laughs> because one of, the, one of the most difficult things about talking about Singapore to the rest of the world is about our state. Because our state has always been characterized as authoritarian, and that's something that we, you know, to a certain extent, Mr. Lee himself actually does not deny that. But the rest of them seem to be keep apologizing for this idea, whereas he is very firm about his own authoritarianism and his idea of how the state has to be governed. And we continue to have that idea, even as recently as being repeated by Daman, the Minister of Finance, that uh, the PAP will always be a dominant state, a dominant party in a one-party state without hopefully being dominating. So I think there is actually quite a lot to talk about, about the nature of our state and whether that nature of our state, having been advantageous for the last 50 years, will it continue to be advantageous? And I think we ought to discuss that issue. Thank, thank you, Bengwan. Okay, to sum up, um, I'll ask each of you to, uh, in two, three minutes to answer all four questions. <laughs> question, question number one from Kishore. Um, what are the critical choices that the state will have to make in the coming years and decades? Question number two from Asad Latif. What is the critical philosophy of our success as a state? Question number three from Dr. Gay Min. Can we have the ideas without the person? And finally, is Singapore an authoritarian state? Janata. Microphone, try, try again. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't want to spoil my record, so I won't try to answer any of the questions. <laughs> uh, um, but let me um, begin by reiterating what I was trying to say. <laughs> Nobody believed that Singapore was viable as a country or a state. Oh, I did. Yeah. Han? I did. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> We've had this argument before. But <laughs> the British didn't think Singapore was viable. The Malayans didn't think Singapore was viable. The communists didn't think Singapore was independent or could be independent. There was only the Malayan Communist Party. There was no Singapore Communist Party. The entity in Singapore was called the Town Committee. That was, that's, that was all that was. And the PAP leadership didn't think Singapore could be independent. So even before you create a state, there has to be a prior decision that it is possible to exist as an independent country. And that decision was forced upon us. And what I was trying to describe was the moment when that decision was made. As for a state, Francis Fukuyama describes somewhere or the other two vectors for a state. One, strength. States can be strong, they can be weak. And two, the scope of the state. Some states have wide, wide scopes, some states have narrow scopes. The American state, for example, is a strong state. Its ability to enforce the law is undoubted. Its capacity to wage war is undoubted. But its scope is not as wide as, say, the Scandinavian countries, 
the scope of the Scandinavian states is concerned, uh, compared to them. In Singapore's case, I don't think there is any doubt that when the decision, when it became plain that you had to exist, there was only one conception of the state that the original leadership had, and that was a strong state. And as for its scope, the scope was wide, but it is not wide on every front. I would say that the scope of the state economically in Singapore is wide, it is intensive, the scope of the state in Mr. Lee's rendition of the, of the, of the concept um, in the provision of social services was somewhat narrower. But whether or not this can continue in the future, whether or not we can remain Singapore without, uh, as Gaming put it, um, how do we do it without, with his ideas but without his personality. I don't think we, we, we will overcome this, the basic fundamental question that we've always faced over the past 50 years, which is there is only one way in order for Singapore to survive. It has to remain exceptional. And how it remains exceptional in the, in the circumstances we find ourselves in is the challenge that we face. It is a more diverse society. Uh, population has changed. Um, the, the landscape in which we we have to live, find ourselves, has changed. And whether we can remain an exceptional society, given the changed circumstances, is a question that we, my generation, the younger generation, will have to ponder. Thank you. We have no alternative but to do it without Mr. Lee. Um, Han Tong, please. Uh, my question to all these answers is that, in fact, many also ask this question, even to Mr. Lee. What do you think of Singapore without Lee Kuan Yew? Of course, Singapore will still be there, but it will not be the same Lee Kuan Yew. And in fact, the other question I did ask him, what if uh, you were now in uh, China, that means your forefather did not no, uh, migrate to Singapore. He said, I may be still very brilliant, and, uh, but I don't think that I will be, uh, I, the most I can reach is the governor of the Guangdong province. And that's a system. So our system here enable anyone who are able, everyone who are there to rise to whatever field that they uh, strive to be. And that's a question, uh, I think, uh, also in uh, the minds of many. The other uh, common comment of our, our current stage is that there's one Chinese saying, 十四造英雄, or 英雄造十四. Whether the situation create a hero or hero create a, a situation. Looking back in the last 50, 60 years, I would say the situation then, as a return student, enable him to decide that I would, we should no longer under British uh, government. We should be uh, merged with Malaysia to be a bigger economy, a bigger country, and multilingual, multi-racial uh, society. That is, thinking, that is his thinking from the day one. So I would say that for future leaders, uh, bearing in mind this, always must bear in mind this, that you are unique because you are multi-racial, multilingual society. Once this field, Singapore will be nowhere. And uh, Mr. Lee also always reminds us, especially for the Chinese, if you are good in Chinese, you are super in Chinese, you cannot add value to the world. Because there are how many million or billion Chinese there? We add value because we are multilingual. We add value because we have a gateway to the West. We are bilingual. We, are, uh, we, we can really communicate uh, through West to East or East to West. So I would say that uh, this is a, a big idea of Mr. Lee uh, from day one, and it may happen from now on. The future leaders should bear in mind this. And uh, whether you call it uh, whatever forms, whatever uh, ideology, uh, I remember that the Fan Zhuang Pi, the community chief, uh, met Mr. Lee in Beijing in 1979 and told him, you are really a Kuai Tai, uh, a very unique, uh, awkward kind of uh, uh, baby born. To, to, to the society. And he just really can't understand how can Singapore be so successful thereafter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we, will, we will adjourn and come back at 11 o'clock. We will shorten the tea break to 15 minutes because we have a very important uh, second panel on the rule of law. And unlike the first panel, the two panelists in the second panel will address the topic of the panel. <laughs> <laughs>